Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam he takes precedence for the believers over their own lives. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is more dear to the believers than their own lives. They prefer him over themselves sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In a rigorously authenticated hadith in Bukhari and Muslim he said peace and blessings of God be upon him I swear by the one who holds my soul in his hand. He said, none of you truly believe or none of you are a perfect believer until I am more beloved than his parents, than his children and the whole of humanity. And the, and the muhaddithin, the scholars of hadith, they say about this hadith that this hadith indicates two types of love. There is a hub aqli. There is a love that is rooted in the rational faculty. This is someone who loves the Prophet ﷺ because they know that it's good for him. And the muhaddithin use an analogy. Like someone who's ill, someone who has a disease and they take a pill, even though the pill is bitter, they take it anyway because the intellect, the rational faculty, the aql dictates to him that this is something good for me. But then there's another type of love. Because when you get to know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you get to know him, when you have ma'rifah of him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this type of hub aqli converts to hub imani, a hub that is based on iman. Because we know that a requisite of mahabba, of true love, is ma'rifah. You have to love, you have to know someone before you can love them. How did the Sahaba manifest their love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Look at the hadith that they mention. al shamail al-Nabawiyyah, Abu Isa Tirmidhi mentions 55 chapters about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first chapter is called Babu ma ja'a fi khalqi rasulillah. The chapter that comes describing the physical characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You might wonder what does this have to do with anything? Abdullah ibn Umar mentioned a hadith that there are 11, some say 17 white hairs on the entire head of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they're concentrated at the temples. And he said, هَذِهِ مِنْ هُدْ وَأَخَوَاتُهَا This is from the surah Hud and its, and its sisters, meaning the few surahs after it. Why does he mention this? Why is this important? Why do we have to know the number of white hairs on the head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why did the Sahaba mention it? They mention it because they loved him. They loved him. And when you love someone, you want to know everything about that person. Don't you? You just don't want to know what that person said, but how did they say it? What did they look like? How did they walk? How did they talk? How did they eat? This is why the Sahaba mentioned these things. Because they're annihilated in the love of the Prophet wasallam, And this love is for fi sabilillah. This is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali karrama Allahu wajha. He said, "Kana sallallahu alaihi wasallam ahabba ilayna min kulli shay'in wa min al ma al barid." He said, "Radiyallahu taala anhu." Sayyidina Ali. He said, "The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was more beloved to us than anything, even more so, even more so than cold water." Look at the analogy. What does cold water mean for the desert Arab? It means life itself. This is an analogy for life itself. We loved him more than, li more than life itself. No one knows the religion better than the Sahaba. Khairun nas qarni. The best generation is my generation, he said sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is someone annihilated in the mahabba and the akhlaq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Fi sabilillah. The affair is all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said to the Prophet sallallahu this is mentioned in many, many books, including uh, Kitab al-Shifa, Qadi Iya, and many, many others, that he came to the Prophet sallallahu and said, Ya Rasulullah, I prefer Abu Talib to, come, to become Muslim over Abu Quhaifa. I prefer Abu Talib. Who is Abu Talib? He is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu the man who raised him, his paternal uncle. I prefer your uncle to become Muslim over Abu Quhaifa. Who is Abu Quhaifa? The father of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. He's saying, I prefer your uncle to become Muslim and go to Jannah over my own father. This is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Why did he say that? Because the Prophet's happiness is his happiness. When the Prophet sallallahu would smile, the Sahaba would smile. When he would cry, the, the Sahaba would cry. There's many, many stories like this demonstrating the deep love they had for him. Khubayb ibn Adi al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was taken by Quraysh during a wartime situation, in prison during the sacred months, and then taken outside of Mecca to a place called Tan'im, where they basically crucified him. 
Hubayb ibn Adi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and they said to him as he was hanging on the stake the Quraysh, the mushrikeen of the Quraysh they were jeering and deriding him and saying don't you wish that Muhammad was in your place and you were safe at home with your family listen to the response of Hubayb ibn Adi he said I don't wish a thorn to, to prick the finger of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi alayhi wa sallam and then he said Ya Allah there is no one here to convey my salam to your Habib. Convey my salam to your Habib. And according to Ibn Hisham, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was in a majlis in Medina to Munawwara at that time. And Zayd ibn Haditha and others were around him. And suddenly there came upon him a feeling like the revelation was descending. And he said, Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah, ya Khubayb. What has happened? O Messenger of God. Khubayb, your brother is being martyred in Mecca. And Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, who was there at the time, obviously was not Muslim at this time. He said an interesting comment that began, watered some seeds in his heart that grew into Iman later on. He said, I have never seen anyone love anyone like the companions of Muhammad love Muhammad. On the day of Ghazwat Uhud, the Prophet was under siege the Sahaba, about 30 of them, made a human shield around his physical person, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 360 degrees around him. One of them was Nusayba bin Tukab, a female companion that had come to give water to the Mujahideen. And now she found that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is under siege. She picks up a sword and stands in front of an armed horseman named Abdullah ibn Qami'ah, who had just killed Mus'ab ibn Umar, thinking Mus'ab was the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he started shouting, Qataltu Muhammadan, I have killed Muhammad. And Shaitan, he heard this on the other side of the battlefield. And he began the shi'ar, this battle cry amongst the mushrikeen, Qutila Muhammad, Qutila Muhammad. Many the Sahaba, they left the battlefield. Go protect the city of Medina. Losing heart, taking the wind out of their sails. Because they heard, they heard their beloved had been killed. Nusayba bin Tukab stood her ground picked up a sword, stood in front of this man, Abdullah ibn Qami'ah, who realized that this was Mus'ab. Now the Prophet is here. So he begins to charge and she stands in front of his horse. And he turns the blade over. Because he won't kill a woman on the battlefield. In Jahali, rules of engagement. Pre-Islamic rules of engagement. You don't attack, attack women and children. You have so-called first world countries right now, dropping bombs on innocent civilians, of men, women and children. This is barbaric. This is barbarism. All of these tactics is haram, according to Sharia. Dropping neutron bombs, hydrogen bombs, these are haram, according to our Sharia. But other people do it, so-called first world nations, right? Real politique, whatever it takes, by any means necessary. But this mushrik, who just had b believed he had killed the Prophet wasallam, he's not going to attack a woman, he has the common decency. Not to attack a woman on the battlefield. So he stops dead in his tracks and he pulls the, he turns the blade over and he begins tapping her on the shoulder from his horse. Meaning, get out of the way. Nusayba says in the hadith, I wanted to run away. I turned around. My beloved is under siege. I stood my ground. And then he increases the severity of the blows, fracturing her clavicle. She falls, he goes around. And her son was there, Zaid. And he comes running, Ummi, Um, my mother, my mother. And what does she say? She says to Zaid, Get away from me and protect the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. An nabiyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim. The believers prefer the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over their own lives. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into Medina to Munawwara, he stayed in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu and it was a two-story house and Abu Ayyub put him on the ground floor because he said it's easier for you to come in and out people are going to visit you so Abu Ayyub and his wife were on the second floor and after a couple of days it suddenly occurred to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari this is you know an insight into the, the, the thought process of a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa after a couple of days he said ah we're walking above the head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this is su'al adab this is bad adab with the Prophet ﷺ, we're walking above him. This is a Sahabi. No one knows the deen better than the Sahaba. No one knows the khayru nas qarni. This is the best generation. So he came down. Ya Rasulullah, I'm sorry. Let's switch places. And the Prophet ﷺ said, don't worry about that. It's okay, it's easier for me. Don't worry about that. 
But Abu Ayyub and his wife would shimmy across the walls of their room so they don't walk above his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, bring him food. And he wouldn't eat the whole plate. And he and his wife would look at the plate and try to determine which part of the dish he entered his hand into the dish so they could eat from that same side. This is mentioned in our traditions. And one time he didn't even touch the plate. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he ran downstairs <coughs> in a panic. Oh, Messenger of God, did I breach Adab with you? What happened? Did I offend you? Did my wife offend you? Please forgive us. What happened? What happened? What happened? He said, no, 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 there's onions in this. I don't eat onions. I speak with Jibreel alayhi salam. I don't eat onions. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. There's three reasons why you love, according to the ulama. Jamal, kamal, and ihsan. Jamal means beauty, physical beauty. When someone's beautiful, you naturally incline towards that person. And according to our aqidah, no one was more physically beautiful than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much so that our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said if the women of Yusuf would have seen my Yusuf, they would have cut their hearts. Forget about their hands. Abu Huraira said, ma ra'aytu shay'an ahsanu minhu. I have not, he didn't say Mara Aitu, Rajulan, Basharan, Insanan. I have Shay'an. I have not seen anything more beautiful than him. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then Kamal, perfection. Innama bu'ithtu li utammima makarim al akhlaq. He said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I was only sent to perfect your character. Wa innaka la ala khulukin na'zeem. Verily, you dominate magnificent character. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A perfect equilibrium. The perfect Adamic creature. Al-insan al-kamil. A perfect equilibrium of Jamali and Jalali attributes in the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Physical beauty. Perfection and ihsan. And no one has shown us more ihsan. Bi idhnillah than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No human being. He is a means of our guidance. He is the sabab of our hidayah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is our shafi' on the yawm al-qiyamah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bi idhnillah ta'ala. Again, all of the affair, the entire affair is about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent us a messenger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran to obey the messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a verse in the Quran called Ayatul Imtihan, the verse of examination. We have to take a test, an examination, like you take the bar exam or the CPA exam. We have to test ourselves. Qul in kuntum rahim. This is called Ayatul Imtihan, the verse of examination. Say, if you really love Allah, a lot, of, a lot of people claim to love God. Muslims, Jews, and Christians, a lot of people claim to love God. Say, if you love Allah, follow me. Say, tell them, oh Muhammad, if you claim to love Allah, follow me. You have to have ittiba' of the Prophet ﷺ. Then will Allah love you. Yuhbib. This verse is in the jassiv mood, present active jassiv. Al-mudari or al-majzoom, which means it's, 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 it's responding to something. It's a result clause. If you love Allah, follow me. Then will Allah love you. Then will Allah love you and forgive you your sins. Subhanallah. There's a lot of people that are made to believe. And this is really coming out of evangelical Christian preaching, the prosperity gospel. And a lot of Muslims are buying into this kind of theology, this rhetoric that basically states that the amount of love that God has for you is commensurate with the amount of money in your bank account. So the wealthier you are, the more God loves you. Very simplistic worldview. What kind of theology is that? That's not what the Quran is teaching. What does the Quran say? That the level of love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for you is commensurate with the amount of ittiba, with the amount of adherence you have to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This is how to capture the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But let's look at this verse a little bit closer. Because we have to have tadabbur and tafakkur of the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Allah asks us, don't they reflect deeply? Tadabbur means to penetrate something to its end. To find the end of something. Do they not penetrate the meanings of this Qur'an? Do we just listen to it? We have no idea what it's saying. We don't make an attempt to learn Arabic. To learn ulum al-Qur'an. It's just elevator music. We're bored in tarawih. Is this what the Qur'an is for? أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Do we not reflect on the Qur'an? Qul, Allah says Qul. What is Qul? Present active imperative. Who is Allah talking to? 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, there's some du'at they stand in front of Christian audiences, and they say to the Christian audience, you know, the name Isa alayhi salam is in the Quran five times more than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is a true statement. This is a true statement, but very misleading, because a person who hears that might be led to believe that Isa alayhi salam is five times more important than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That is five times the maqam of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is part of our belief that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sahib maqam mahmud khair al khalki Allah imam al mursaleen habibu rabb al alamin. These are exalted titles. He is the best of creation. So why is it that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is only mentioned five times in the Quran, and Isa alayhi salam mentioned twenty-five times, Musa alayhi salam over seventy times? What does that mean? Why does that happen? Because Allah subhanahu wa taala is speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And which servant is more honored by the king, the one that the king is talking about in the third person, who's not even there, or the one that the king invites to the throne room and speaks to him directly and says, "Qul say." This is our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He speaks to him directly, sallallahu alaihi. We have to think about the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wallahu Rasuluhu ahku an yurduhu." Allah and His Messenger. It is more befitting that you please Him. Now, if you read this in Arabic at a first glance, you might think there's a grammatical error in the Quran because there's two subjects mentioned: Allah wa Rasuluhu ahku an yurduhu. You think who? Who is singular? Mufrad al Ghaib. It should be an ahku an yurduhu ma. It should be muthanna. It should be dual. But why the singular? This is not an error. This is not a mistake. <coughs> According to Imam Al Qurtubi, rahimahullah taala, he said this ayah demonstrates a close, intimate relationship between the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Allah subhanahu wa taala, his Lord, and that he says that Allah subhanahu wa taala made the Prophet's pleasure his pleasure. When you please the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you automatically please Allah subhanahu wa taala. When you anger, when you anger the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you automatically anger Allah subhanahu wa taala. Fatima tun bid'atu minni, faman aghdabha, faman faqad aghdabani, wa man aghdabani, faqad aghdab Allah. Subhanallah. Fatima is a piece of my flesh. Whoever angers her angers me. Whoever angers me has angered Allah subhanahu wa taala. He said, "The Quran says, 'Ma yuti al Rasul, fakat ata Allah. Whoever obeys the Messenger is obeying Allah. <coughs> that there's a unity, there's a oneness, there's an equality on the level of obedience, not on the level of ontology. This is where, with all due respect, our Christian friends made a grievous error in their theology when they say that Isa alayhi salam and God share an ontology. They're ontologically, they're essentially the same." Whereas we know Lahut and Nasut, divinity and humanity are never mixed. Maraj al Bahraini yal Taqiyan, bainahum barzakhun la yabqiyan. They never mix. But what does it mean? It means the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a perfected agent of Allah subhanahu wa taala. All of his actions are guided. All of his words are guided. In the Hadith Qudsi in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Allah Allah taala. Allah says, my servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved. To me, than his faraid, ولا يزال عبد يتقرب إلي بالنوافل. And he continues to draw close unto me with his supererogatory acts of worship, حتى أحبه until I love him. And then I become the eye by which he sees. I become the hand by which he grabs. And I become the foot by which he walks. And if you were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. This hadith Qudsi, sound hadith, rigorously authenticated. What does it mean? We can't take hakiki. Allah doesn't become your eye. Allah doesn't become your hand. Allah doesn't become your foot. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ مَهْمَ تَسَوَّرْتَ بِبَالِكْ فَاللَّهُ لَا يُشْبِهُ ذَلِكْ Whatever you can think of, that is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean according to Abu Qasim al-Junaid? Rahimahullah ta'ala. He says this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguards the entire limb, all of the limbs of this person. This person becomes a perfected agent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person has, who is upon total guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَا وَمَا رَمَيْتَ You did not throw when you threw. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam picked up some stones and threw them at the Quraysh and Ghazwat Badr, Allah says, you did not throw when you threw. Allah threw. Allah threw. 
That's what the Quran says. What does that mean? Allah incarnated? No, we don't believe in hulul and tajzim. These are Christian beliefs, these are Hindu beliefs. What does it mean? It means that the actions of the Prophet وسلم, are totally guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the meaning of it. By the star when it goes down, your companion is not being misled, nor is he, dis nor is, nor is he astray. And he never speaks. Yantiqu is fi'l mudari. This is a present tense verb. We have to learn some Arabic. All of us should try. A present tense verb is usually negated by lam alif. La, la yantiqu. But here, wa ma yantiqu anil hawa. This ma means never. Never does the Prophet wasallam speak from his hawa, from his caprice. Never. Everything he says is wahi. Shall, shall we write down from you? One of his companions said, Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, shall I write down from you when you're angry? Should I, should I record that? By the one who sent me in truth. Nothing comes out of this. Nothing comes out of this except the truth. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Subhanallah. So we have to read the Quran at a deeper level. We're running out of time. But these verses we read sometimes, we think they're mundane. <clears throat> we pass over them. But they're deep verses. We could talk about that maybe later, inshallah ta'ala. But I want to end with this, inshallah. That we have to submit sometimes to Allah and His Messenger. We have to just submit. Sometimes we try to over-rationalize things. Right? We have to understand that the aql is useful. No doubt about it. We can't make sense of the world without it. We can't function. But we have to believe in things sometimes that are supra-rational. That we cannot explain them rationally. Because they come in our scripture. Dalil qat'i. And oftentimes, unfortunately, we try to over-rationalize. And it affects our taslim and istislam. It affects our submission and resignation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the brother who told me one time, during Ramadan, he wasn't fasting. He said, why aren't you fasting? Oh, fasting was for back then. You know, you know people back then, they need to store food for a month. You know, brother, they need to store food. Oh, really? Yeah, you don't know this. I'm a postmodern, you know, I'm a, I'm a progressive. You're an antiquated traditionalist. You don't know what you're talking about. Buying into this bifurcation that you have Muslims who really understand the Quran and they're antinomian, they don't even follow the Sharia. Subhanallah. Right? And you have these traditionalists who don't know what they're doing, who believe in fairy tales. No. We believe in fasting. Kutiba alaykum as siyam is very clear. The brother who said, why do I have to wash my left hand if I break my wudu? What does my left hand have to do with the other thing? What does it have to do with it? What does it have to do with it? What do you want me to say? We submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't over-rationalize. We believe in super-rational transmission. They're called mutaghayyabat or sam'iyat. Right? So, the story in the Quran, Musa alayhi salam with Bani Israel, they come to the Bahar and Fir'aun is behind them. And what do Bani Israel say to Musa alayhi salam? Inna la mudrakun, we're done. This is what their aql suggested to them. There's an ocean in front of us, Fir'aun and his junood are behind us. This is over. We're going to get slaughtered. But they forgot who they were dealing with. Rasulullah Musa alayhi salam. Who is Musa alayhi salam dealing with? The one who describes himself by saying, إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقْلُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُنْ Whenever he decrees a matter, he says to it, be, and there it is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Musa alayhi salam by way of wahi, idrib al-bahra bi'asaq, strike the sea with your cane, with your staff. Musa alayhi salam didn't say, oh, 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 let me think about that. Doesn't make sense to me. Sorry Allah, doesn't make sense to me. What's that going to do? Okay, maybe I'll try. No. No. Mubashiratan. Immediately, Musa alayhi salam struck. Because he knows who he's, he's dealing with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are we dealing with? This is what we have to ask ourselves. The Prophet sallallahu was invited to a meal. <coughs> he took some sahaba, the house of Abu Ubaid. We'll end with this inshallah ta'ala. Abu Ubaid, he cooked a goat. <coughs> and the Prophet sallallahu he said, Nawilni ad dira Serve me the forequarter, the shoulder of the goat. This hadith in the Shama'il al Nabawiyah and other books. Serve me the forequarter of the goat. And he said, here you go, O Messenger of God. 
The Prophet ﷺ took a few bites and he passed it to the Sahaba. He did not eat a lot. Sallallahu alayhi alayhi wa sallam. He did not eat a lot when he could have eaten a lot. When his Sahaba were starving, he would starve with them. Tying, st tying rocks around his stomach to stave off hunger pangs. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a man of the people. Took a few bites and he passed it. And then he said, Ya Aba Ubaid, na wilni ad dira. Give me a, a shoulder. Here you go. Took a few bites and passed it. And then he said, Ya Aba Ubaid, Ya Aba Ubaid, na wilni ad dira. Serve me another shoulder. Ya Rasulullah, wa kam the shati min dira. So, O Messenger of God, how many shoulders does a goat have? Only two. What do you mean, serve me another? Right? Why? Because for Abu Urbaid, this is what his intellect dictated to him. This is what the aql told him. So he stopped, hesitated. Listen to the response of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Waladi nafsi bi yadi. I swear by the one who holds my soul in his hand. Lo sakat. If you had just kept quiet, you would have served me a shoulder every single time I asked you. Every single time I asked you. Why? Who are we dealing with? The Prophet ﷺ. Who is he dealing with? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah has power over all things. Don't marginalize the Prophet ﷺ. Don't, don't, don't render his sunnah null and void as some dark forces in this country are trying to do. Trying to say, oh, he's historical, he's historicized, it has nothing or little to do. The Rand Corporation says this. They have a proposed hermeneutic of the Quran. The Prophet's sunnah has little or no relevance to Muslims' lives today. Muslims are buying into this. We shouldn't buy into this. Marginalizing the sunnah of the Prophet Is this what the Quran says? No, it sure does not. We submit to the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه هو هو التواب الرحيم إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. صلاة وسلام على رسول الله وعلى ساداتنا وإمتنا أبي بكر عمر عثمان وعلي. رضي الله تعالى عن أصحاب رسول الله إجمعين يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إننا نسألك بنور وجهك الكريم وبحقق عليك حسن الخاتمة عند الممات لنا ولأحبابنا ولجميع المسلمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولى في وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبا على على طاعتك وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون وأقيموا الصلاة